So Tulsi Gabbard has announced that she's running for president in 2020. Uh, most of you probably know Tulsi Gabbard already, and um, it's likely because she stood up to the DNC, and so many people on the left, you know, uh, have a very favorable opinion of her because she's one of very few people on the left who who stood up to the DNC, and that's definitely taking a risk um, in a way that shows that perhaps she's not a, a politician who's only all about her career, that it's a little deeper than that for somebody like Tulsi Gabbard. Uh, now, the other reason why I know her is because she was a very early supporter of Bernie Sanders. And again, I think that you get a lot of brownie points on the left if if that's the stance that you took, because let's face it, even senators like Elizabeth Warren did not hop on the Bernie train early on. And in fact, she didn't hop on the Bernie train at all. When we all know, ideologically, she aligns much more with Bernie Sanders than with uh, Hillary Clinton. And remember, Bernie lost Massachusetts, um, I think it was by like one point or something crazy. So the argument has been made that perhaps um, if it was, if Elizabeth Warren did jump in, that Bernie could have won Massachusetts and that could have changed the race uh, moving forward. So... I don't want to pick too much on Elizabeth Warren in this segment. This segment is about Tulsi Gabbard, but the fact that Tulsi Gabbard was a very early supporter of Bernie Sanders uh, gave her a lot of credibility in the eyes of the left. So I wanted to uh, take some time here to go through her record, and I'm going to give you the good and the bad. And, you know, she's going to be one of many politicians in a crowded field. I think that... <laughs> The one thing I've reiterated from the beginning is that I need there to be more establishment types in the race than actual lefties in the race because I want the establishment types to split their vote more and make it so that the last person standing is one of the lefties. So as of right now, <clears throat> we're getting into a little bit of questionable territory in terms of how many lefties are jumping in the race. Uh, I still think that the number of actual... Um, Establishment candidates will be more than the number of lefties, so ultimately I'm not I'm not sounding the alarm yet, but there are it's almost like I'm a little nervous because there are gonna be many good candidates who are running. N normally you'd think, oh, that's a wonderful thing. Yeah, normally it would be a wonderful thing, but I need there to be more establishment candidates so we split the vote uh, more among the establishment wing. Okay, so first let's talk about the good when it comes to Tulsi Gabbard. Her voting record is uh, pro-choice. She supported the stimulus program. Her voting record is pro-gay. Now put a little asterisk by that because we're going to come back to the issue of LGBTQ rights in a little bit. Um, but her voting record is pro-gay. Uh, she supported legalizing hemp. She fought for legal marijuana. She fought for... Uh, here's a really interesting one because it puts her in a league above other politicians. You know how everybody screams about Russian interference in the Democratic Party, the elected Democratic Party? Oh my God, our elections are not safe, and there's Russian interference, and oh, what are we going to do? Let's talk about this endlessly and use it to score political points. That's what they do. What, did, what does Tulsi Gabbard do? She's been fighting for paper ballots for our elections. So for all the talk of the corporate Democrat politicians, she comes out and says, okay, you can talk all you want. I have a fucking solution here. Paper ballots. So you want to actually have elections with integrity? Support my bill for paper ballots. And it's fucking crickets. Hardly any of the establishment types are on board with this. But she was pushing really hard for it because she really believes in it. She thinks it's the right answer. And I think she's right. So that's a policy that she's kind of like the champion of, which is wonderful. Um, she's for cutting defense spending, and she's been for a very long time. She's in favor of repealing the Patriot Act. She, she voted that way. She's an early, early supporter of Medicare for All, which is important. I think we do need to make um, distinctions between the politicians who, after hearing the public backlash, hopped on the bandwagon and said, okay, yeah, sure, sure, Medicare for all, and politicians who led the way, and politicians who were very early on in support of Medicare for all, because I think that shows you how they would prioritize if they were in office, you know? You don't want the person who's kind of tepidly on board 
to to be the president because then uh, you know they're not going to lead on that front and they're not going to fight on that front. Now Tulsi Gabbard was an early supporter of Medicare for all, so again that is super important. Um, she voted to raise the minimum wage in Congress. She uh, voted to protect Social Security and Medicare. She supports raising taxes on the rich. It's a policy that fifty eight percent of Americans support, and obviously is something we desperately need. Um, and she's in favor of getting out of Afghanistan. So those are all uh, positive things. I don't want to just brush by them. I think they're uh, super important. And she is, in many ways, in, you know, the class of politicians that the left likes the most. In fact, she was one of three votes total against the rules package because uh, of PAYGO. So she, she was against PAYGO when... It, it was only Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, Ro Khanna, and Tulsi Gabbard. And I think, I think what she's good at is listening to, listening to the people and knowing when there are certain red lines that the people have. She's like, okay, I'm here to represent you, so you got it. I'm going to vote against PAYGO. Now, unfortunately, we have to get to some of the bad. Because there is some bad. You know, I like Tulsi very much, but that doesn't mean uh, we get to kind of brush over things where, that are areas of disagreement. And I've done this with everybody uh, who's announced thus far. You know, Richard Ojeda, I like as a strong populist uh, candidate, but that doesn't mean that we, you know, have to bury the fact that he even said he mostly voted for Republicans his entire life for president. I mean, that means Mitt Romney over Obama, which I'm like, oh, how do you do that? You know, so you got to give all the information because fair is fair and objective is objective. Um, and like I said, when we get I I'll do like a power rankings, my own personal power rankings when we have the field set. And I'll tell you who my favorite is, who my second favorite, who my third favorite, so on and so forth. Um, but here's the bad. So I didn't know this until recently, but she used to be anti-gay. Now, I don't, like, that alone, virtually every politician in the United States has been anti-gay at one point or another, because, you know, you go back far enough prior to, like, 2008, and every poll of the American people was overwhelmingly anti-gay. Now, that's not an excuse to say, oh, it is what it is. No, it's still bad. But it, at least it's something that, um, you know, is not, like, out of the ordinary bad. But what is out of the ordinary bad is... It wasn't just that she was anti-gay, she was kind of virulently anti-gay. Now, she's not anymore, let's be clear, not anymore, um, and in fact her voting record is pro-gay, but she did have, you know, I read some of the quotes and I was cringing, some of them were talking about, quote, homosexual extremists. Damn. So she was against gay marriage at a point, she said stuff like that, and I think, honestly, I think it's because Apparently, her, her father was super anti-gay, and I guess when you're raised in an environment like that, it's hard to break free from that brainwashing. Now, that, again, that's not an excuse. It's just an explanation. But you determine how much you want to hold that against her because this is an instance of, like, genuinely evolving on it. I don't think it was because of political, simply political reasons. I think at some point she actually realized, like, no, I don't agree with this. I think this is wrong, and uh, I'm not gonna take, I'm not gonna take this position anymore. But I do think it's it's okay to bring it up. Like some people would say, even bringing up the fact that she used to be anti-gay is a smear. I don't think it's a smear. I think that uh, it's a piece of information that, and people could judge accordingly as to whether or not they think that's something that's like you know, um, totally out of bounds and and disqualifies her in their mind. I mean, you can make the point that I don't think Bernie was ever anti-gay. I mean, we covered a story um, back when he was the, what was it, the mayor of uh, Burlington, Vermont. There was an article about how it was like a trans mecca before anybody even believed in trans rights. Um, Bernie was open and inclusive and, and, and for them. And, you know, hey, that, <laughs> that says something about the kind of guy Bernie is. But everybody knows if Bernie jumps in the race, which I think he is, I'm going to support him. That's not taking a shot at Tulsi. It's just, it is what it is. Everybody knows that. I Ideologically, I line, line up with him almost perfectly. There are areas of disagreement, but it's really, uh, you know, marginal. Um, 
but yeah, so she did have old uh, anti-gay quotes talking about homosexual extremists. She was against gay marriage. She has genuinely evolved on the issue, but you determine how much you want to hold that against her. Um, she also has close ties to far-right Hindu nationalists. Now, this is one of the more legitimate criticisms, in my opinion, that she's, um, you know, she's kind of a supporter of Modi. And Modi has been referred to, there's an article in The Guardian that kind of laid this out in detail going back a year or two. He's kind of called, like, the head of the Hindu Taliban. You know, there's a vicious repression against uh, Muslim communities in India. And it's bad. And we've covered some of the stories. And um, that's nothing to scoff at. And what she has done is, is kind of aligned with a far-right... Uh, government, Hindu nationalist uh, government in India. And there was an article in The Intercept recently which explained how um, there was even quite a bit of funding that went from kind of far-right uh, Hindu groups, uh, Hindu American groups or American Indian groups, it, they went, it went to Gabbard. Like, she got funded from a lot of these characters. So to have her have close ties to Hindu nationalists in India, I think that's a legitimate criticism. I think you can make that criticism and it not be some sort of a smear attack. Um, the other thing is she supports drone strikes. So she's good on foreign policy otherwise, and she's not in favor of interventionist regime change wars, and I trust her judgment more than 95% of other Democrats, and I want to be clear about that. But she does support, you know, drone strikes and air power, and you can make the case, so does Bernie. Like, Bernie does too. That's one of the areas where many people on the left disagree with him. Yeah, fair enough. So you could say it's a wash between her and Bernie uh, in this particular realm where she does have quotes where she says, when it comes to, like, regime change wars, uh, I'm a dove. When it comes to, like, the war on terror and specific uh, attacks against ISIS and Al-Qaeda, I'm a hawk. So that's what she says. You know, hey, maybe it's a little more interventionist than most people on the left. And again, you determine how much you want to hold that against her. But that is her position. Um, now, she also voted against a bill that would welcome uh, Syrian refugees and I think Iraqi refugees in the same bill. And, you know, I, this is one of those votes that because a lot of people are like, hey, it's, it's weird that like Steve Bannon and there are many like unsavory characters on the right who don't hate Tulsi Gabbard. And people are like, I wonder why that is. Well, honestly, I think that it, this vote is one of the reasons why. Now, I'm not of the mindset, like many other people on the left are, that you have to almost shut off your brain when it comes to um, immigrants and refugees and, and how we approach that. I'm not somebody who's, you know, in favor of, like, totally op open borders, for example. I don't know how many on people on the left are. I think some people are. Um, so, but I think there is a legitimate discussion to be had as to, hey, what's the line? You know, like, where do we draw the line in terms of the numbers of refugees and, and immigrants that, that we're letting in at this particular time? Like, that's, I think that's a legitimate discussion when there are some people, again, I don't know how many, who would say that's inherently bigoted. You cannot do that. You just kind of have to let everybody in and, and, and be with open arms and, and that's your default position. If you deviate from that, then you're wrong. I don't agree with that. I think there is a discussion to be had. Hey, what's the line? How many at a given time? For a variety of reasons, I think that that's a legitimate discussion. But yeah, to vote against having them come in, period, I don't agree with that at all. At all. <laughs> at all, at all. So, um, and I think, again, that's why there's some unsavory characters who kind of um, look at her favorably. Uh, then, now this criticism, I was actually wrong about a part of this criticism that I mentioned recently. I had said that she voted against the Iran deal. That's actually not true. She voted for the Iran deal. But um, the line in the Jacobin article that I read, which did, I think, misstate it, uh, the real point they should have made is she at, she was expressing a tremendous amount of skepticism over the Iran deal and was very hesitant to do it. So that's like a mixed one. Like, I, I think the Iran deal was wonderful. And once it was law and she did vote for it, she 
kind of changed her tune and then even like criticized Trump for pulling out of the Iran deal and said we need to stay in the Iran deal. So I think that there's a little bit, there's some hacky criticism of Gabbard over this particular issue where they say and they act like, well, she voted against it. And I misstated that because, again, I read it, the article was wrong and I was parroting that article. Um, she didn't vote against it. She voted for it. But early on, she expressed a lot of skepticism over the deal, which is not something I agree with. I thought that it should have been all systems go and we all should have been like screaming at the top of our lungs to get that thing implemented before it was implemented. But again, to her credit, she did vote for the deal. And then now she's been a staunch defender of it as Trump has been pulling out. So I don't think that's a very legitimate criticism. But there's a point to be made that early on she was very skeptical of it. Um, and then finally, there's two things. She had some questionable pro-Israel votes, which used the language of like Palestinians are using human shields and we condemn it. And I think it was during the Gaza massacre in 2014. Um, which is not good. Now, again, the best you have on this issue is Bernie, and Bernie's not great on the issue of Israel-Palestine, but it's not like she's really totally bucking orthodoxy on that front, and I wish she would. Uh, and then the final, and I think most legitimate criticism, and I didn't know this until a few days ago, is there's now a video that's circulating uh, on Twitter, and I watched the whole thing, and it's true, where um, she's asked about the Senate torture report. This is a few years ago. And uh, her answer is basically like, you know, I have uh, very mixed feelings. And if there was some sort of a ticking time bomb scenario, I would do anything to keep the American people safe. Or as a soldier, do you have a very different perspective on the use of torture? Um, very bluntly, I'm conflicted. I'm conflicted on this report. There are, uh, I think the jury is still out on the report itself. Uh, there have been comments that there are things missing or it was incomplete, and there, there are differing opinions on the report itself. Mm. Uh, but I, as I think about it myself, uh, clearly we would not like to see any human, uh, any person around the world being treated inhumanely. Uh, on the other side, I can also understand uh, that any of us, if we're in a situation where our family or our community, our state or our country, is, is in a place where, let's say in an hour, hmm. a nuclear bomb or an attack hmm. will go off unless this information is found. Uh, I believe that if I were the President of the United States, that I would do everything in my power to keep the American people safe. Hmm. Uh, so this is, this is an area that uh, I have conflicting feelings on. Although, of course, there are questions about whether torture actually leads to uh, the correct intel, right? Yeah. Like that debate carries on. And that debate carries on. There are those who uh, are uh, in the position of conducting these interrogations, some who have said it does uh, work, it does, and others who have said uh, it doesn't. Listen, I like Tulsi Gabbard, I do, um, but that is that's a that's a right wing answer, is what that is. Anytime you're asked about torture, uh, honestly, your answer should be there is no such thing as a little bit of torture. There is no such thing as a ticking time bomb. I mean, what a fucking fairy tale bullshit notion the idea it's like oh we have perfect information and we know that there's a ticking time bomb and we know that this one person knows that the, the details of it and i mean it's just it's fantasy land it's concocted to try to rationalize torture and then once you open the door to torture there is no little bit of torture there is no only torturing in the right circumstances the reality is once you allow torture you allow torture and you're fucking tortures and you're violating U.S. law, the Constitution, international law, the Geneva Convention, the Nuremberg Tribunal. So what ends up happening is it they end up using it. And they use it against people who are innocent. By the way, that is what happened. We don't need to, like, have the hypothetical conversation. But what about the ticking time bomb? No. The Senate torture report explained how we ended up doing anal rape torture. Literally. They would do anal feeding. They shoved a tube up, up people's asses and then pumped liquid food up there. This is what we did. We did sleep deprivation. We did um, loud music torture where you keep loud music playing for an extended period of time. And people are like, sitting there like, holy shit, this is literally driving me crazy. They, they did hypothermia torture. You know what that is? That's when they throw cold water on you, leave you in a cold cell, leave and then come back in the morning. And guess what? Somebody died when we did that. 
And of course, the person who died, no evidence they ever did any wrongdoing. Because this, this idea that the government always gets it right, as if like, oh, by the way, everybody who we captured and put in Gitmo or put in Abu Ghraib, yeah, we know that they're guilty, they're terrorists. Again, the opposite is true, and we have the evidence, it's provable. There's a guy named Marat Kurnaz, who was a German citizen, who was swept up and, and held it, I think it was Abu Ghraib or Gitmo, I'm not sure which one, and we tortured him. The guy was a fucking German citizen, didn't do anything wrong. The idea that you trust the government, like Dick Cheney or fucking George W. Bush or whoever the leaders may be, the generals, I don't care. The idea that you trust them to like, oh, don't worry, they'll get it. It'll be like a ticking time bomb scenario and they're doing it to save the country. Or we are completely and utterly destroying our own values and we're becoming the devil that we claim we're trying to avoid. And we violate international law. We violate human rights as we talk about how everybody else are the baddies. You know, that, uh, that one really got to me. That one really got to me. I don't have any sympathy for, like, the, the, even that, like, wishy-washy, well, hypothetically, if there's a ticking time bomb scenario on torture, I don't, I'm not okay with that. I'm not okay with that, because that's never how it's functionally actually used. Whenever it's used, guys, we know, we've seen the evidence. Did you know that the overwhelming majority of the people who were held at Guantanamo Bay, totally innocent? How do I know that? Well, the story's broke that George W. Bush and Dick Cheney reached out to warlords in Pakistan and Afghanistan and said, hey, listen, you guys got to send it. We were just attacked here on 9-11. You got to send us the people in Al-Qaeda who are responsible. So guess what warlords in Pakistan and Afghanistan did? They just rounded up their own political enemies and shipped them to the U.S. and said, yeah, they're Al-Qaeda. <laughs> and then Dick Cheney and George W. Bush locked them up indefinitely, no due process, and we ended up torturing many of them. Totally innocent people just tortured them because that's how the real world works. We don't always get it. That's why you have due process because the government doesn't always get it right. If we're going to fucking torture because we think maybe, maybe not, there's a fucking ticking time bomb scenario. So that's my biggest, that's my biggest issue with her. And I didn't know that until the last few days. And that one broke my heart. Um, now, I don't know. If she'll be asked about it in the debates, if she'll answer the question or any of that stuff. But yeah, that, uh, that one hurt. So that's Tulsi Gabbard. She's running for president in 2020. And, um, listen, I said it once, I'll say it again. If Bernie Sanders jumps in the race, which I think he is going to do that, that's where my support goes. That doesn't mean that there's not a hierarchy of... Um, of other politicians and that there's not a power ranking because there is. And like I said, I will give you the power ranking once, once we have the field settled. I hope there's more establishment types than progressive types. That's what I, I want more than anything else. That's what we need more than anything else. But yeah, there's, it's going to be a very fascinating race because there's a lot of really, really interesting characters in the race. Tulsi Gabbard is fascinating. Richard Ojeda is fascinating. Um, having Elizabeth Warren on stage is fascinating. The rhetoric in the debates is certainly going to be sh strongly to the left of where it was in 2016 when it was Bernie who was making all the powerful arguments and all the other ones were like, beep, 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 beep. you're going to have a lot of strong arguments being made on stage. Um, but there you have it. Another uh, lefty in the race, Tulsi Gabbard. And we'll see what happens from here.